Welcome back to the second annual Nat King Cole Generation Hope Educators Conference. Our final clinician today is Ms. Chiho Feinler. Distinguished as a prominent thought leader in the public music education field, Chiho Feinler has, is responsible for designing and overseeing the implementation of Save the Music Foundation's national programs aimed to ensuring equity and access to comprehensive music education in America's public schools. She's a recipient of the Honorary West Virginian Award and currently serves on multiple national and regional boards, including the Center for the Arts Education and Social Emotional Learning and Arts Ed Newark. Speaking on the power of and school-centered music education ecosystem, please welcome Chiho Feinler. Good afternoon, Chiho. I think I am still not able to share a screen, but that's okay. I think uh, while the, somebody is doing the magic, I can um, say a little bit about myself maybe when they can see, see me and then hopefully by then we can do a screen share. Oh, now I can do the screen share. So thank you so much. Um, this is uh, uh, such an, a pleasure to be here. Just really quickly, who am I? I am Chiho Feinler. Um, thank you, uh, Edward, for uh, 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 saying the, a, a beautiful introduction. I am with the Save the Music Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that donates instruments to public school. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about who I am. I am, uh, uh, for those of you who may not be, see this, be able to see the screen, I am an Asian woman uh, with a long uh, black hair. Um, I guess you, nobody can see me even though it, you, uh, you can see my screen, but I'm five feet tall um, and uh, uh, I'm a, a rather petite woman. And uh, I've been uh, just have a pleasure of serving at Save the Music Foundation. The lens that I bring to this conversation is that, that I am a nonprofit worker. I've never been a teacher but rather I really um, identify myself and pride myself to be a cheerleader to the music teachers. Um, I also have had a privilege to have a national point of views as a Save the Music Foundation works in 42 states as well as Washington DC and Puerto Rico um, in mostly a large city setting as well as a rural setting. And I've been with the Save the Music Foundation for more than 12 years. And before that, I was with a symphony orchestra so that's basically of who I am. I should also, also note that there might always a cocktail conversation of what do you think I play? I play the euphonium. So again, as a, a woman of five feet tall, Asian woman, it's not the, the regular instrument that, that somebody will put me onto it, but I just wanted to share that with you. So I'm a band kid um, through and through. I wanted to just share the ground rules and community agreements, which I learned from our one of our great partners in arts at Newark in Newark, New Jersey. And just wanted to say that, that you know, in this space, I wanted to bring is a is a uh, safe space. It's a confidential space. If some uh, other your fellow participants wanted to share something, let's assume that it's, it's something that's shared. We can keep it here. What happened in the Nat King Cole Foundation conference stays in the Nat King Cole Foundation, right? Um, unless we wanted to uh, shout out of the, um, on the top of the roof. We also wanted to just a couple of things that, that I just wanted to say that, that um, I may say something wrong or you may kind of, a, you know, what I say might not be translated to you in the right way that I intended to. If I say something that really offended you or hurt you or needed a clarification, please um, chat to the host. Um, uh, Edric, you have all the you know uh, uh, the rights and the power to stop me and to clarify, and please note that the, you know we have I have every intention to be uh, to deliver the the right message, the right kind of a, a messaging. But I just wanted to say that. And again, this, with that, no such thing as a completely safe zone, right? But let's be a brave zone. So I just wanted to say, what a year, assuming that there are many of your music teachers, um, you know, thank you so much for all that you've done and all that you are doing and all that you will be doing. So I just, please um, humor me and just, if you have a glass of water or a cup of milk or coffee or whatever, if you have something like that with you, I would love to kind of join me and you don't have to turn on the, uh, this is a kind of a simple exercise. So just imagine that, that you're holding this glass of water. However, however, you know, it could be on the top, it could be in the half of it. 
It could be a very thin glass, it could be whatever. And just imagine that, that you're holding this glass and, I, and you know, maybe you don't know how long you have to hold it. Maybe you're in a very crowded subway and there's nothing top on the top and you have a, you're holding the hot coffee. How do you feel about it? How does your muscle feel about it? How does your brain think about it? So this is really to symbolize that, that you know, you know the expression of glass is half full, glass is half empty, whatever you can, we can release that the glass. This really says that, that you know, your workload may not be changed from the, the year 2019 to year 2020 and 2021, but your environment certainly changed um, uh, mainly thanks to COVID, but maybe you're going through something, you're personally and stuff like that. So that's the stress. Like, you know, you think about that, you know, your, your workload is the same, but you may have to do it, you know, using the three computers. You may have to be, you may be dealing with the half of the students in classroom, half of the students online. You may be dealing with it that 100% that um, uh, you know, high, uh, virtual. You may be dealing with it, um, taking care of your sick family member and teaching. So we all went through an amazing time period and we still are going through an amazing time period. So I just wanted to really applaud you and really thank you for all that you've been through. I am also a mother of a seven year old second grader going on third grader. My daughter, my own daughter was mostly in virtual and God, I failed as a homeschool teacher for 30 seconds in March, 2020. So I just cannot you know, thank you enough that all of you've done. I just wanted to visualize that the heroic works that, that you know, my community of teachers, which are grantee teachers that went through and just really quickly, you know, there is a, uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, I don't know why. Um, I don't know if you can see the cursor, you cannot, but um, um, here, maybe you can see that now. In the bottom will be a, a school, high school in West Virginia who actually went to the nursing home and played for the nursing home resident when it was a complete shutdown so that they can deliver some uh, gift of music. Here's the music teachers in Newark, New Jersey who are handing off the instruments along with a free meal so the students can play at home. Here's the same story with the uh, um, ukulele handing out, this is in Pajaro, um, California. Here is a music supervisor just, you know, unpacking everything on her own because nobody was there to help her. Here is a teacher in Baltimore, Maryland, who is Zooming the class um, using the donated instruments. Here's the teacher who are doing the car parade to celebrate the students. Here is a teacher in Philadelphia marching um, Black Lives Matter um, uh, march with her student and handing out the, the waters and making sure that the students are safe. So, and I know that all of you have many of the stories that you've done. So um, I will put my email at the end. I would love to hear it if you are so kind to share or if you wanna, you know, um, Chat to Edric, perhaps maybe Edric can kind of share that at the end. Um, I just wanted to say that, but again, I cannot thank you enough um, on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Um, I will just go through really quickly of Save the Music Foundation. We are a nonprofit that, uh, foundation that helps students, schools, and communities reach their full potential through the power of making music. We do this through investing in schools. So we donate instruments um, to public school system. We support uh, teachers by providing professional development and the support, uh, resource support, as well as the advocating for music education. We really think that and believe that, that we are in it to really advocate for music educators and music education. And here's a grant requirement um, for the uh, grants. Um, I will be sharing this deck with Edric so that you guys can all have that. So you do not have to take a screenshot or anything like that. So I just wanted to show this. And also just the map, as I mentioned, we are in 42 states as well as so Puerto Rico and Washington DC. Um, so, and then these are the, the list of communities that, that will be making grants this coming school year. But we always take a family approach that, that uh, you know, since 1997, we've been provided to more than 22, almost 2200 schools. Um, in 277 communities. And I still speak with some of the districts that and the communities who received grants from us 20 years ago, even though I wasn't there at the time, um, but we are still having those relationships and we really cherish and uh, applaud all of that is going on and more. So why school-centered music education um, ecosystem and why we say that? 
this is really the our history of learning how we did it and then we are trying to learn what can we do better so first say 20 years 1997 to maybe 2000 you know 15 16 17 we were really kind of a maybe two ways so we get the funding as a nonprofit we get a funding from a local and national foundations or the companies and stuff like that we purchase instruments and we put the instruments in the school and hope that it sticks and just sort of yes we are still kind of a keeping toes but we weren't really actively doing so and i would make a confession that that i think there was definitely a savior mentality we as in a base in new york uh, new york city kind of you know we'll just robin hood right we'll give you the instruments you know for the the better of the music education and good luck with that and we are really quickly realizing that, that that wasn't a sustainable way to go so then we really started the community centered model because after working with more than 200 communities by then you know 20 years later it maybe we're slow learners but we just learned that, that right each community there are some similarities, but there is a dissimilarities. So there might be some of the people who make up the community may look different. This, you know, it might be the one school might be uh, uh, the principal led uh, decision making, and as opposed to the some districts are more superintendent led, or is there a school board members? Is there some uh, performing arts center that makes a huge role and everybody has to know it? You know, stuff like that. So we really wanted to be embedded in the community. So we're not coming in from New York City and telling you the New York City way and the only way. We wanted to really learn the community way so we can work together. So with that, this is sort of a, my visual. We wanted to really center a school music program, your program is to be in the center. And we're just part of the villagers. Nobody's more important than the others. Everybody is equally important, but the most importantly, the most important folks are you and your students. So with that, you can kind of look at it that there was a higher ed that would play the role for the teacher pathway. Of course, community-based organizations, philanthropic support that, that, you know, in this wheel, we are part of the philanthropic support. Principals, of course, parents, music industry, right? It could be a retailers, manufacturers, business, and artists. Um, and of course the district commitments, but really is what's in the center is the, uh, uh, the school music programs. So I wanted to really share with you a couple of different examples and then just really wanted to you to, to think about what is your, you know, what, who gets the, um, the red color um, and stuff like that. And we can certainly have the conversation about it. Um, just assuming, um, I'll just kind of start with a Newark, New Jersey, just because we just gave a little shout out to Arts at New Jersey, Newark rather. Um, so it was a five year collective impact project um, uh, investing in 45 schools. The district itself about, about have about 35,000 students. So by this fall, we'll be making, we'll be in um, 45 schools, most of which are K-8 schools. So that, that we estimate that, that now, um, after all this, 98% 90, of the entire school district has an access to music education. It's a district that was really going through, went through a political turmoil. Um, I don't know if anybody um, remembers or heard of the Facebook Mark Zuckerberg's $100 million gift to the city of Newark. And it really kind of, uh, you know, the aftermath of it is that, that it was really, you know, we didn't, nobody could tell us that, that how much of the money actually went to the schools and the teachers and the students. So it was a, you know, there's a lot of charter movements and, and, and what have you as well. And it's not that one is right and one is bad. It just really disrupted the public education. So many of the music teachers, for instance, were pink slept. So by the time we came in 2017, Mind you that, that there are local, beautiful local organizations like Arts at Newark, who is a um, arts education coalition organization, membership coalition organization. So their members were New Jersey Symphony Orchestra, New Jersey Performing Arts Center, Newark Museum, you know, what have you. And they were really laying the ground. So we certainly do not claim that, that we came in and everything got better. 
we came in whilst the things are getting so much better and in the, the, the great trajectory of you know the renaissance of the music education or arts education there and we're very happy to be part of it because the lack of instruments were the, the huge need and that's where we can come in and then uh, do the void so as a result we, um, the superintendent, um, which is, his, this is his third or fourth year now, he declared that every school has to have a, a music and arts teachers in each of the schools. Some of you that might be like, why now? Or why wasn't there before? That was a huge thing for Newark. And then if you actually, uh, when you get the deck, there is a case study um, that's embedded in this link there. So you can look at it, how it was, but we had estimated about 16 teachers were hired. Uh, in the course of us being there. And then if this past school year alone, mind you, Newark was on the lockdown and 100% virtual from March 16th of 2020 to April 12th of 2021, they still hired 27 new arts and music teachers. So it really kind of a gives the testimony to the value of the music and arts education. Again, not because of us alone, but collaborative effort. So with that, our wheel, so to speak, in Newark is like this. So there's an arts at Newark and JPAC and JSO who went to our grantee schools and beyond to share our, um, you know, the, 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 the great music. And, then, you know, uh, so we put the instruments in the school. New Jersey Symphony Orchestra musicians went to the school and did a show and tell of different instruments so that kids can be inspired to do a sign up of the uh, things. Grammy Museum, which is the satellite of the LA's Grammy Museum, which happened to be in um, New York, uh, downtown New York. They hosted some of the free on, um, uh, music technology or DJ camp. We have a couple of high schools where we put the music technology. So those students could go to those camps where they had an uh, opportunity to do a backstage tour because Grammy Museum is attached to the Prudential Center. It's a, it's a concert arena plus the um, basketball arena. So the, the students got to do a backstage tour and the meet and greet with the artists who are performing there and looking at how the technology and how the, all of the you know, workers work, who did the lighting and stuff like that. There is a community college who is now launching the dual enrollment with a CTE, career technology education on the music technology with one of the grantee high schools. Montclair State is trying to do a pathway project pro program so that the students can go to the university, but also more importantly, the university students can then go back to New York teaching as a student teachers and then hopefully as a new teachers as they are hiring more. And of course, then there's a um, manufacturers who are providing some of the clinicians, Queen Latifah, Wyclef John, who are both of whom are from Newark, have done some of the um, uh, performances and uh, uh, events, and also the New Jersey MEA, Music Educators Association, who are doing some of the master class and then partnership and stuff like that. So that is our wheel. Um, so just get, and then of course, there's some of the funders. And I'm going to skip um, more just so that, that we have time to do a conversation. So then the, another one might be a stock opposite, West Virginia. When you think of West Virginia, you probably think of how many people are there. And that's true. Um, it's a, a relatively rural state. Um, we, this is a, a one, one and only state that we actually do a statewide initiative. So Newark, it was a district-wide initiative of Newark, New Jersey. Here in West Virginia, we're doing the statewide initiative, which means that we are in all 55 county school districts, and we are already in 112 middle schools um, out of the 160 plus middle schools. They do have music teachers um, in each of the schools, but they were lacking so significantly with the instruments and the majority of schools are title ones um, because of the, the dying industry of calls and energies and stuff like that. So um, we've been in this uh, a really great way of working with the uh, uh, governor's office, as well as the governor appointed um, position of the uh, West Virginia uh, Department of um, Arts, Culture and History. So um, I will get to brag that, that maybe you can see it a little bit in this, no, this side. I can do this, this side. No, here. You can see that, that there's a plaque. I was just honored as an honorary West Virginian. 
by the governor uh, uh, back last month. And uh, I just, you know, really am proud to be embedded in the community. It was also mentioned in the governor's of state of state speech. I don't know if you've ever been in those things where usually the governor talks about this is our GDP is and this is our economy is. And by the way, arts education is important. And here is the folks from West um, uh, Save the Music Foundation who are doing it. So that was televised, you know, it, it just really weighs. And also the first lady comes with us to visit any of the schools. So this is the, our wheel there, where there's the, you know, the where state department, state government is really involved. This coming fall, West Virginia Symphony, which is the statewide symphony orchestra, will be doing a side by side with some of our grantee school students. Um, and that will be live streamed um, across the state. Um, we've been really been embedded with uh, West Virginia MEA. And so those are really great um, partnership there. Of course, WVU, Marshall University, and then many others um, are notifying get noticed about it. I believe the Bluefield College just announced that, that they are going to start uh, with the uh, music education program because again, the same thing with a large city system, the rural system have been really seeing the shortage of the music teachers and the shortage of the music teacher pathway. So they'll be embedded that. I've also heard the beautiful story of one school that, uh, whose band teacher retired. They were so concerned to hire a new, new, new set of people because it was in a very rural area. To their surprise, they had a number of applicants because they knew that the, the new instruments were there and they're part of the Save the Music. So, you know, not to brag about ourselves, but we were very happy to be used, right, to really advance um, on that. So, so this is where, um, you know, what is your music education ecosystem? What do you think it is? And this is where I would love to bring Edric in um, for any questions or anything like that. Yes, yeah, so um, just to our audience again, please feel free to ask questions, send me a message. Uh, I'll try to um, ask as many as I can um, through our time together. Um, but I'll go ahead and start off first while we have our audience starting to do some typing. Um, you know, we, I, I thought about this, you know, I was studying your PowerPoint before our presentation today and this community centered model, this education ecosystem wheel, uh, I, I know our, our previous presenter, um, Dr. Drain, was mentioning if he only knew some of the things now earlier on, this would have been, you know, much easier path for him as, as an educator. And as a former band director, when we talk about our ecosystem, you know, we, we never, I, I, let me back up a little bit. When I think of ecosystem, I think of, oh, I'm on an Apple ecosystem. My iPhone attached to my iPad. My iPad goes to my iMac. And that's kind of really the time I use ecosystem. But I never thought about it in the system of, of, of music education. And because as a band director, a young band director, I, I really just thought my ecosystem was just my principal, my band parents. And, you know, that was it. And when you have this diagram here to really give a deeper dive of knowing who are the, the people at the table, you know, if you will, and, and to understand it's more than just the parents, it's the principals, it's the, it's the higher ed, it's the local schools that's involved, the local universities, uh, it's the local vendors that could play a part of this, the local organizations, whether it be a local orchestra or whatever it may be, that that's makes a, a great deal of sense to me. And just seeing it, because I'm a visual learner, just seeing it here, uh, it was just fantastic. And I just wanted to just applaud, you know, the, the idea of putting this together so we can visually see how we can really impact um, our, our community and our ensembles. Thank you so much for saying that. And, you know, Edric, sort of you mentioned like, you know, what would, I wish I've done this, right? The moment that I rejoined the Save the Music Foundation, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but we didn't know any better. Um, but I mentioned in the very beginning that, that I was formerly a, a head of education at the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra, which, um, and, and I reside in New Jersey, Northern New Jersey. And I remember when I was with the symphony that, that the biggest kind of a money-making program, so to speak, and it sounds really catty, but um, you know, the, the, the program that attracted most funding was an in-school program in Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, because some reason, some of the funders cannot give money directly to schools, but they still want to see the impact in the schools. 
So what the New Jersey Symphony did at the time was to pair with the music teacher, classroom music teacher, who may not be necessarily string teachers, right? Because those of you are maybe a killer saxophone player, um, but somehow you're doing a string program. So then the New Jersey Symphony string players were paired with the Newark um, music, the, the given school's music teacher, and did sort of a modified Suzuki program. And I say modified because the, um, you know parents weren't required to be part of it. But in, in some way, the music teacher, classroom music teacher was a parent to learn alongside. And they did a study. It was a randomly selected group of students. And then the study showed that that, that student's um, test score was higher than their peers or their um, behavior was better and stuff like that. And that alone basically funded the entire education program of the New Jersey Symphony. I mean, don't tell anybody, I guess you're recording. But anyway, so you know, know that, that, that uh, your community partners or soon to be partners need you as much as you need them. Mm -hmm. So know that, that it, right, um, it's a win-win situation. As long as they are putting you on the center, the right partner should ask you what you need as, as opposed to this is what we do. Now, you might just wanna know what they do and you can just modify what works for you, whatever it is. But, you know, just, you know, if they don't seek out to you, well, shame on them, but you should seek, seek them out because they would be very glad to embrace you. And I think, again, I think they need you more than you need them. But at the end of the day, students need every opportunity that, that they can get. Because like I said, I am a band kid. I know nothing about strings. So I know nothing about music technology. Um, and you may have a brilliant student who is really into more music technology or who's really into you know, percussion because I'm a brass player, I cannot teach that. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. There are a number of organizations and now with COVID and I say with COVID, thanks to COVID, this is one time I would say that the virtual world has been really widened. So I have recently spoke with an organization that do a, a private teaching and I connected them with a, a, a public school system and they may be 500 miles apart or 5,000 miles apart, but they can do it in virtually. So, you know, look at every angle. Great. And, and, and so I want to go back and feel free audience to just chime in questions to me. I'll, I'll, again, I'll try to get through them. I, you, you mentioned the rural um, initiative with West Virginia and then the urban with New Jersey. And I remember being in Palm Beach County as an arts administrator there, we had a single school initiative. And, and so I, for people that's new to this and that's maybe new teachers, we had a new teacher on in our last session, just second year in, save the music how, how can he or she or anyone get involved with having save the music because if you have something for west virginia that's a whole state initiative what's the first step of them reaching out to see whether it's a district initiative or a state initiative you know whether they're coming from west virginia or or or, or big urban area what, what what is your suggestion as the first outreach to save the music yeah, great question. So 99% of the time, it's a district initiative. We do not do a single school initiative. So because we want to be, again, the community-centered approach, right? We're in a community. We know that the students maybe move around and all of that stuff. So like our goal is that once we start um, partnering with a community, so given community equals school district, we are there till every single student in that community or the school district has an access to. So we try not to do at least, uh, we'll do one school there and then another school in a completely different side of the country. West Virginia is a one very unique case because quite frankly, the number of schools within the West Virginia is even smaller than some of the large urban school district. Yep. <laughs> so let's just say that. So um, uh, to answer your really question, the first step is really to reach out to us. Um, you never know. We do have some strategic plan of where we want it to be, um, which, you know, looking at it mostly uh, a large city or the large area, but we also are kind of looking at the regional approach as well. And also we do look at a two year, three year, four year, five year, in, even in ahead of time. So please do reach out to us. And I have a couple of uh, last couple of slides. Um, don't let me forget as a shameless plug. And maybe I can do that now. Um, we do have a music education resource page that we have on our website that is completely free for you to access. Um, we have now close to 200 online resources that, that you can look at and all of that stuff. 
I would certainly give a special attention to the fundraising advocacy partnership because um, if you don't know this yet, please know that all of the COVID relief fund, so some of you may have gotten the, the checks from the government, the big, large checks went to the K-12 education, I believe the tune of $64 billion divided by each of the state. So the state like New Jersey has $4 billion. So the Louisiana has 1.4, it's depending on the population and the title one. And your program, your music program is entitled to get to that funding because music education is part of the well-rounded education. So if your principal tell you that, that, oh, this is for the learning loss, that's for math and English, wrong. You suffered a learning loss too, not being able to meet in the band or not being able to meet in person or sing together. Even if you're in person, I know some of the schools are forbidding to, to sing or doing the um, wind instrument um, thing. You, you can no longer share instruments. That's a COVID, COVID reason that you need more instruments. So please know that. And that should be um, listed in here. And then there's others. And also that, that we are about to launch uh, a monthly PD, virtual PD series, specifically on music education and SEL. There are more to come. And I'll be sure to you know try to get the word out to you as well. But please follow us on our website and the um, social media, but it will be again, completely free. So that's another way that, that we may not be able to give you the instruments, but hopefully the, the COVID relief funding can take care of that. And then some of the programming things, we, we certainly wanna be in your music education ecosystem. So hopefully you will list us here or here, um, you know, sorry, here or here in your wheel, even though we may not be in your district giving the instrument. And, and Gio, would you mind probably sharing that, that link of that uh, address um, that we can add to this session that you're talking about as far as the, the free resources and what have? Um... Yes, I will do my best to figure that out. I, yeah, no problem. I will do it later. Yes. So because then once we get that, we can pin that in the chat um, so we can have our, our, our audience can have access to that. Yeah, I will actually put the our website and it's very easy to find on our website. Um, it, it says online resources or online music education resources or something like that. Okay, hold on. I just received that. I'm just gonna just dump it in there. Hopefully yeah. everyone can see that. And okay, I, cool. I figure that, that I can chat to everyone. I didn't know that. So. And Carolyn just sent us um, a link to with the resources she just gave us a link to. So yeah, we're Thank good. You. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, another question, just putting on my arts administrator's cap. Um, when you're saying, you know, you need to reach out to to you and, and then we'd make a decision on whether it's uh, how big of the initiative will be. Um, I'm just thinking if I was an arts administrator, uh, and a band director reached out or orchestra teacher reached out to me saying, hey, we want to be a part of Save the Music. And then I go to my powers that be. The first thing I know that upper leadership talks about at a district office, at least in, in my um, previous position, is MOUs, um, memorandums of understanding or mem memorandums of agreement or what have you. Is, is there anything on your side or that you, you guys encounter with MOUs or is that strictly left on the district side of it? It's strictly left on the district side of it. And then I, I will say that, that when we deal with the district and then the, as you said, it, the powers to be, we sort of put the founders hat and say, we're giving you these goods. So I, I should also verify that, that we do not give money. We, we raise money and we purchase instruments and then the instruments get to the schools and the, and the district. So we actually do require the district to sign the grant agreement. We, we, we basically treat it as a grant. So. When, if you want to show up to the uh, our PD series, there is no right. There is no. I don't. I can't foresee any district telling you that, that you have to have an MOU with us in order for you to attend the uh, free webinar on your own time. But if you your school or your district receive the grants of instruments, we always do the grant agreement with a district level. I will share that the um, one district that we're dealing with, which shall remain nameless, um, requires eight signatures from the district side to execute the grant agreement. But they do because they're motivated, right? There is no, um, there is no financial sharing. They don't have to pay us to get the instruments and stuff like that. We're not a vendor per se, so that's how we kind of deal with it. And then, sort of the program support that we do, we kind of slip it in. 
Right. Okay. Well, that, that that's that's helpful. And, and I just want to go back because I'm I'm really fascinated by the the statewide West Virginia, um, you know, initiative. Who who do you know who was involved in that? Was there one leading county? Was it did it start from the state and work its way down? I, I I've never heard of such a thing where a state takes on things. I guess Florida, South Florida is just its own state in itself. Yes, you think about that. <laughs> with its own country. <laughs> right, I know. In Palm Beach County, we had a uh, 186 schools, and I know you you've worked with Day County, and that's they're double that. You know, mm -hmm. so when you talk about the uniqueness of uh, of West Virginia. What where did that start, and how was that filtered through 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 acceptance by all school districts? Yeah, so I will do the folklore um, telling, and but it, I wasn't there, but I I, I have confirmed mm -hmm. through many people that was a true story. So it really started with um, uh, this one individual curator now, Randall Reed Smith, who is a governor appointed position, mm -hmm. who is now a head of the uh, Depart West Virginia Dep Department of Arts, Culture and History. So think of it is that if you have your state have an um, arts council, it'd be even a higher position than that. So yeah. he's in charge of the, all of the museums in the, in the state his actually office deals with um, all of the historic markers. I don't know if you, some of the uh, um, state has that, but there's there. So he was born and raised in West Virginia. He went to Germany to, he had an opera career, tenor, um, sang and had a career in, in Germany for 14 years. He came back uh, to West Virginia and then governor, now U.S. Senator Manchin, Joe Manchin. Um, I don't know if you've heard his name lately in the cable news. Um, he was a governor then and, and somehow they knew each other and Governor Manchin appointed him to be this position. Now, he is a very dynamic individual. and I, I swear to God that, that he knows everybody in West Virginia and he is a big um, fan and promoter of marching band because he actually was a featured um, baton twirler. And he also was a singer, but he also marched, I think in the, uh, he played saxophone. So he really, and, and also you should know that West Virginia like Texas and Florida, big football state, right? So the marching band is a huge culture of the, each of the, the, the town. So I've actually been to a high school that has a high school building has only 200 students and 105 of them are in marching band, wow. kind of a, a deal, right? So it was a very much so fabric of that community, right? So, but then other I, I thing is that they were again, mostly title one, um, this is 2009. So, you know, the coal industry was really declining and, you know, you see a lot of poverty there. And this is even before the whole opioid issues. So he really um, uh, connected with this one philanthropist, Mr. Clay, um, who was an amateur violinist and a music lover himself. So he kind of uh, uh, heard, uh, heard about us. And then so Rondo, um, invited my predecessor at the time to the, the West Virginia. He toured, um, you know, he gave us a tour of the schools and see like these instruments, look at this clarinet that was bought in 1920. You know what I mean? Like stuff like that, right? So it was like in the Southern West Virginia, three hour, four hour outside of Charleston state capital. And uh, so he said like, so, hey, you know, do you want to come and work with us? And I guess my predecessor said, well, you know, like you guys already have music teachers. You know what I mean? Like we kind of usually do like a start from the zero, like no position, no nothing. And he basically, and Rondo is like, had a fit and said, I will leave you here till you say yes to me. Wow. And the rest is the history. And he based, you know, obviously we were like, uh, okay. And then um, he's been really supportive and he's really kind of involved in the community. So like the philanthropic support, half of it comes from his own state. So it might be a person who is, owns the town funeral home is writing a check to go into this project or the, so he's like the biggest fundraiser on this own project, which is not biting into his own budget. So it's not a competing thing and just really working together. And again, the first lady, so it started with a Gail Manchin, the Senator Manchin's wife, when she was a first lady, she will come to the school visits. Um, so I get to travel every October, um, all corner of the state. Um, I calculated this, that I've actually traveled about 5,000 uh, miles and more. And I've been to 36 counties out of the 55 counties. I've been to 60 middle schools in the state. Wow. Um, 
and many of which the first lady came with me. So every time I go, the news camera follows us, the newspaper follows us. I'm just known as a say, the music lady. Um, so that's sort of how it started. So, and, and I will, uh, maybe I'm digressing a little bit, but it's the great advocacy story came out that, that yes, West Virginia is a very small state, a rural state, but um, very powerful state. So I mentioned that the governor mentioned or the Senator mentioned who, is, who I think is the one of the powerful, most, uh, most powerful politician right now. Um, there's another Senator is uh, 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 Shelley Moore Capital who at the time in 2017 was the chair of appropriation committee in the Senate, meaning that, that she was in charge of the, the committee that does a federal funding allocation. So I don't know if you, any of you remember in 2017, that was the very first budget that came out of then president. And that budget did not include the budget for the National Endowment for the Arts. I happened to be in, in uh, Washington DC for fly-in with the National Association for Music Education. Rondo happened to be in town as well. And I said, oh, I'm here. And he goes, well, do you wanna meet my senators? So I met both Manchin and uh, uh, Senator Moore Capital um, personally. Senator Moore Capital is a Republican um, senator. And Rondo let me do my spiel of music education funding, but also the National Endowment for um, for education, uh, National Endowment for the Arts funding. Pre uh, maybe around the same time, then president basically said, oh, I'm eliminating the NEA funding because coal miners don't need arts. Mm. So basically I came, went in and said, you know, Senator Capitol, you know the value of the arts. It, it, this, is, this is going to affect your constituents, your state people. So the next day, New York Times featured her quote saying that the coal miners needs arts too. Please put back the arts funding. Wow. So these kind of, a, you know, again, I just happen to be in the place, the right place. You know what I mean? So it's not me. It's the, the ecosystem that made it happen. Um, so any of the uh, West Virginia senators and the congressmen, um, you know, so every time that there was, there was a couple of dicey situation all I had to do was to text Rondo and then Rondo would make sure that they're all of them so I I'm looking at the voting records and I'm making sure that they're voting in the arts way mm -hmm. so those are kind of the things um, that, that we are able to do through this statewide um, initiative that it's been you know hopefully impacting the, the rest of the country as well wow what a what a fascinating story I thank you for, sh for sharing that I, I was I was I was given like a, a surface question and you just went really deep and just, but, but that's what we have to know. And that could, I was very curious on, I've never heard more of a state initiative like that, especially not for, for the arts. So uh, that would just really led to that. And, you know, I just want to go back to, to what you were mentioning. It's going to be very important as we return back to the school year about, you know, music educators uh, understanding, you know, the funding that's going to be available to them um for for instruments uh, I, I think that's going to be a major question uh, uh from day one as far as safety uh you know the days of of you know nine students playing you know one clarinet um you know is is impossible i mean it's just that those days are gone you know right. I, it's just we have to start figuring out those ways and there are resources there but we ha also have to educate ourselves and, and i also tell art you know music educator arts educators um you know, let's let's go back to being a music educator. As a as a band, we always know the best thing is tone, tone quality. Tone will get you half the battle of any evaluation or anything that that's pleasing to the ear. And so, when we are starting to write and type behind a keyboard or a message to our administrators, think about the tone. You know, being able to send a message to them saying, "Where's my money?" You know, <laughs> doesn't work like that. You know, and I think you know. We have to make sure we we extend that olive branch and, and make sure our tone that comes across when we speak about inquiring about this funding and, and it's there, but you know from a legal standpoint. But as you said, some some principals might say I may not know a whole lot about it, but then you should be able to have the research and so having those resources available for teachers to to be able to speak well and and talking points uh, is going to be very critical um, to that. I just uh, we have only a few minutes left. Uh, we talked, we, we put a lot of weight on the rural side of it. Um, and we, I, I know you talked about New Jersey. How was the comparison and contrast of, 
uh, the urban school districts between New Jersey experience and Miami-Dade County? Um, you know, Miami-Dade has been really interesting for us that, that we actually have a very formal agreement and a partnership with five other local Miami organizations. So that's been really great. Miami-Dade is also interesting that, that uh, um, one of the few ones that I know that only music education is offered only to second grade and above. So again, just kind of a, a disconnect of that. So, you know, many of the schools do not have a full-time teachers. Okay. But again, that much more, right? The community-based organizations are very important. So we're actually working on, and um, if once you get the deck, there's a little bit of that in the deck there, um, where uh, we have, we're working in the, the one feeder pattern. So there are 12 schools and a five, uh, six different organizations, including ourselves, that has, that could be an after-school guitar to um, mm -hmm. L-System organizations, to in-school teaching artists working alongside with, you know, again, alongside with your um, teachers and stuff like that, just really making sure that the equity is there within that um, feeder pattern. And then our goal is to really um, take that in the different communities, because again, you know this more than I do, it's a county school system. So there's a bunch of municipalities and the feeder patterns put together. Yep. So we're really working on, on that way. It certainly is a, a big, much, much, much bigger district than in Newark, New Jersey. Um, uh, I do believe that the superintendent is paying attention and superintendent is behind it so that the, it's the, the messaging is uh, easier to do. Again, having said that, we are still doing this advocacy and the talking about it and then the importance of, but also that along with working alongside with many of the arts organizations. The larger the districts are, the larger the ecosystem should be. It's just that, that can we work all together so that we are really, so it's not like the one school getting everything. It's just an equity lens that we can work with. Good, good. That's, that, that makes sense. I understand. And, and probably let here's my last question for you. I, I know at the Kennedy Center, we, you know, we're on the Northeast um, area, just slightly south of you guys. Um, but we, we really are making an initiative to, and I, I call it the westward expansion, making sure we develop more teaching artists uh, moving out westward um, to, the, to, to the untapped areas. I know California is thriving, but there's just some areas that we want to really, really support and make more of an emphasis. When you say that you guys are strategically um, looking at you know, expanding, is there, is there a designation or is it like north or is it west? Or is it any particular path or it's just, is it enrollment? What what what's probably some of the indicators? yeah no um so I guess you hear here first um we're really looking at everywhere so um again we're in forty two states already but we want to go here but also here right the the wider but then deeper as well at the same time it's the end it's not deeper or wider it's wider and deeper. Um, so, you know, California certainly is in our still radar because California, unlike you know, Northeast East or um, Florida, elementary music education is a luxury, if you can believe it. So again, just really doing that advocacy of it and trying to make sure that the, the students, you know, are getting the K-12 offering of that. We actually launched the Mississippi Delta. So in a, another rural area, it's not going to be a Mississippi statewide, but the Mississippi Delta. So there's about 18 counties, um, um, wow. as well as the uh, uh, Memphis, Shelby County, Memphis, but really looking at the, um, uh, really the rural area part of the Mississippi Delta. So we have that going on. And then, um, so just, you know, we're really looking at in, in so many levels, obviously in the lens of the need-based. So, we may not, you know, we, you will never see us in some of the very wealthy, you know, California, but it's never going to be, right, like Santa Monica or whatever the very wealthy area would be. Uh, but so that, you know, please know that. Um, but we're looking at it in uh, really the need based areas and also just the areas that, you know, that are in need in music as well. 
Well, you know what, you know, this has been so enlightening. Uh, on behalf of the Nat King Cole Generation Hope, we want to thank you so much, um, Chihil, for sharing your expertise and time today. You were so eloquent and, and, and so enlightening and, and informative. Um, this has been very beneficial for us. And I became more knowledgeable of Save the Music. I knew some about it, but the depths of what you're talking about has just been very, very uh, in encouraging. And I, I hope our audience feels the same way. So thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for the time. And again, thank you to all of you for just showing up and then doing what you do. We, we certainly cannot do our work without you all. So thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Well, that concludes our first day of our session. Uh, I want to thank our presenters, Dr. Bolden, Dr. Drain, and Chiho um, Feinler. I want to thank the Nat King Cole Generation Hope and the Cole Twins, uh, Cole's Twins uh, for their gracious contribution to music education. And lastly, I want to thank um, the audience, you taking part of our session today. We appreciate your participation and your interactions. Um, please tune in tomorrow, um, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please invite more friends uh, and colleagues. It's free. I mean, this is going to be great. We have three amazing clinicians speaking on equity and access to music education. And um, we're looking forward to having you a part of that and inviting more people to take part of this network. Because as, as we know, moving forward, we can only move and make an impact by teaming together for our network and, our, and mostly our students and communities. So thank you so much. Uh, have a great rest of the day.